indwelled by the Holy Spirit. It's his great ministry to teach and recall. He wants to teach you this. This is probably one of the greatest miracles ever in the Bible. The Holy Spirit fertilizing the egg of Mary, a virgin, of a young woman of meritable age from the tribe of Judah and the house of David, and it had to be that way for him to be the Messiah and the Savior of the world. It had to be that way for Jesus, not only to be called Jesus, Savior of people from their sins, but Emmanuel, hypostatic union, 100% God and 100% man in one person that had to qualify to go to the cross and become our Savior for dying in our place for our sins. Pretty powerful Christmas story. Pretty powerful Christmas story. So I'm going to ask you to make a confession if you need to in regard to personal sin in order for the Holy Spirit because you can't study the Bible in carnality, only in spirituality, and he'll teach you great things. He's probably already taught you a lot of stuff today, and we ain't got into study. All we've done is read the Bible. And so, our Father, we thank you today for these that have come our way to study with us. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows, Matthew wrote. And then he laid out 15 clear doctrinal principles of the birth of Christ. The virgin conception of Jesus Christ that makes him the unique man of the universe, Emmanuel. Who became personal to us on the cross when Jesus died for our sins. Was buried and raised from the dead to give us salvation by grace. The work was done by Jesus that the gift because could come by us by grace. Father, we couldn't begin to thank you. Words in the English dictionary don't, don't, are not strong enough nor meaningful enough to tell you what our hearts feel this Christmas for that great gift you've given us individually. So all we can do is tell you we're so thankful. And we pray you would teach us today more of these principles outlaid to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's take a look at this. We have seen, once again, <clears throat> the importance of Greek markers. People often write to me and they say to me, Ron, how come you teach so much the Greek of the Greek language? This is the way it was written. It wasn't written in English. It was written in Greek. And sometimes you cannot see it in the English language because our conjunctions are confusing or our, our, uh, or our conditional, our conditions on a sentence, our ifs are not laid out important. We use ifs very generally in the English language. If somebody uses the word if, for example, you, you have to talk to them a great deal to figure out what they're talking about. In the Greek language, when they used it, it was either a first class, a second class, a third class, or a fourth class, and you knew right away what they were talking about. You didn't have to spend 40 minutes in counseling to get to the point. You could get to it right away. So, we're, and we'll be introduced to some of that. We'll be introduced to some of that. So we're looking at five ideas, because what you find interesting to this passage is divine intervention in the life of Joseph. He didn't divinely intervene with Mary. He said to Mary, you're going to be the mother of, of the Christ child. And she went like, okay. But you're going to have to explain to me how that's going to be. Because I'm a virgin. And you say, we're going to have, you're going to do this right now. And I'm a virgin. And I'm about to take a three-month a three trip to Elizabeth, who's in her trisemester. So how's this going to be? How's this going to work? Well, he says, here's how it's going to work, and he lays it out in Luke. And in the book of Luke, he lays it out. First, well, you should read the first chapter and second chapter of Luke. I can't do everything for you. We don't spend enough time together for me to do all that. So I, what time I spend with you, I try to sell you, try to get you to sail off in your little boat in the right direction 
looking for the, the treasures that are ahead of you in the word of God. So, so here we are, divine intervention. So he, he divinely intervenes on Joseph's behalf. You go like, well, why would he do that with Joseph? Because Joseph is about to make a colossal mistake in his life. Well, he, would he do that to me? Depends on how much of the word of God you know. If you know enough of the word of God, he may not. It depends how urgent it is in the plan of God. If it's not urgent, he may hold off and let you work your way through it. If it's urgent in the plan of God, then he will, he will divinely intervene. Is it urgent in the plan of God? It is because he did what? He divinely intervened. Not only did he divinely intervene, he did it with a teaching angel which was proper in that dispensation of the Jewish age. And he sent Gabriel, who is the teaching angel of Messiah. Listen, you know who was sent to give Jeremiah messianic prophecy or Ezekiel messianic prophecy or David messianic prophecy? You know who that, you know who that person was assigned? That's, that was the teaching angel Gabriel. He was assigned to that mission. You got to read Matthew 1 and 2 and you have to read Luke 1 and 2 and then you can sit down and go like, whoa, I get that. Divine intervention, uh, because Joseph has made a bad decision in his mind. Joseph has made up his mind that he's going to divorce Mary because his false conclusion was that she had fornicated on him. He knew for sure it wasn't his because Mary was not consentable to any of that kind of foolishness before marriage. So how did that happen? Listen, you can't fold him too much on the front side except he's a righteous man. He knew better. You know what his greatest fault was? Joseph's greatest fault. I taught it last week. When this colossal problem came, erupted in his life, he did not go to what does the Bible say. When those big deals come to your life, the first thing you should say and the last thing you should say about it is what does the Bible say? You suppose the, you suppose the Bible has an answer for your problem? You, listen to me. You don't have a problem the Bible don't have an answer for. And when your problem, because of the way you're, you're managing it, becomes greater than your own life, when the world turns upside down, how are you going to get it turned up, upright? If you don't go to the Word of God, it'll never get there. You don't have the power in yourself. You've got your world turned upside down by making a false assumption that leads to a false interpretation, that leads to a false expectation, that leads to a false application, and Joseph is in it. Because, listen, you can't fault him for a moment except he didn't ask, what does the Bible say? Listen, by natural creative law, she's pregnant, conceived by somebody having sex with her. Agreed? I mean, that's not... That's, but you have to ask yourself, Joseph, what does the Bible say? Is there anything in the Bible that says that a Jewish virgin meritable age girl from the tribe of Judah and the house of David could get pregnant without, with, without the creative order of copulation? And the answer is yes. There is one verse, Isaiah 7.14. And we went through that last week, and people go, yeah, but that's only one verse. I told you, I gave you, I gave you a lot of information last week on one verses that are dynamite. Here's one. Romans 3.10. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There are none righteous, no, not one. There are none righteous, no, not one. I, 
Micah 5.2. We talked about Micah 5.2 last time. And all the decisions were made off that one passage by Herod the Great and the Roman Empire. You should read that stuff. Well, God intervened because of Joseph's decision was going the wrong way. Joseph's Joseph's decision is going to involve the perfect timing and the plan of God. Listen, that prophecy of Isaiah 7.14 has laid there dormant, ready to be fulfilled at the exact time in human history. Here's Paul's account of it in Galatians 4.4. Listen to what Paul wrote. When the fullness, the pleroma, when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. You notice those three things? They're called the, the events of the fullness of time. Right? Well, when... The fullness of time came. That's what Matthew's talking about. When the fullness of time came, Christ sent forth his son. Okay? Isaiah 7, 14. I got caught up many years in this word, pleroma. It's an interesting word, and it's used a lot in the Bible, in the Greek usually to fill up something and to fill it and fill it and bring it to completion. I was struck with John 1, 16 and 17. I wrote a book on the fullness of God's grace. I wrote it for myself. Then I taught it. Other people requested it, so I put it in a form to give to people. That's a powerful idea. It didn't just talk about grace. It used pleroma. When you put M-A on the end of a word, it's the idea of a result of whatever the word is about. Pleroma means to fill up a deficiency to its maximum. To fill up a deficiency up to its maximum. And the MA on the end says, and how's that going to be? How's that going to happen? And I used that concept to write a book about it. And I used it to develop six stages of grace to show you the dynamics of the grace of God that begins with salvation and covers your life all the way to eternity. It was all what God showed me about Pleroma that caught my attention and overwhelmed my soul to fill up a deficiency to its maximum. It always begins with Christ on the cross, his burial and his resurrection. When you believe it, you enter into the fullness of God's grace. You can find it in every stage you look for the fullness of it. You look for it at salvation. You look at it for how God meets all of your daily needs. You look at it for how he develops your spiritual growth for ministries and, and for, for great outlays of things going on in your life that you keep everything intact and everybody goes like, I don't see how you deal with what you're going through. They ask you that every day so many times. If you don't have ministry, you get tired of talking about it. But if you have your ministry, you never get tired of talking about it. And then about suffering. Why do, why do we suffer for Christ? Philippians 1.29. Because you've been born again to do that. Because some people in the world can't see Christ except for your suffering. Isn't that interesting? I saw it with my wife. Other people saw it with my wife. Suffering for the glory of God. It's a marvelous thing. Well, the fullness of God's grace. This is what Paul is talking about. But he said, when the fullness of time, when the fullness of time, and he talks about time, when the fullness of time came, and then he gives you, he gives you three points. 
but it gives you three points about it. I mean, you could preach all day on those just, just that one verse and those three points. God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. God intervened also because this decision Joseph is about to make involved God's selection of two spiritual mature believers that were ready to do God's will in his perfect timing. Do you know how difficult it is for God to find two people? I mean, you might find one, but find two people that are sold out for God, that are, are willing to lay it all on the line for God. I love what Mary said when he told her what he was going to do with her, and she said, be it done unto me according to your word. Joseph had no idea when he was thinking about divorcing this woman. What a powerful woman. This is one in a million. He was about to marry one in a million. Not only was she special in his heart, she was special in God's heart, and God chose her to be that. Hail favored one. And we'd all love to have God say that to us. I tell you. I tell you, he was looking, listen, he looked and looked and looked. There's no tell, telling how many candidates come and went, and they finally went Mary. Mary and Joseph. Mary and Joseph. They had a heart for God. They had a heart for God. Joseph had, when he was about to get rid of her, he had no idea what he had. You'll never find another Mary. Well, I can't take Mary. Well, okay. Okay, buddy. Isaiah 7, 14. You know how powerful that is? In Luke, the 24th chapter, when Luke describes the Old Testament, in Luke 24, 44, 45, that's not on your paper. But in Luke 24, 44, 45, when he describes looking at the Old Testament, he described it, study it in three sections. Now, when we look at our English Bible, they got all kinds of sections. But for Luke, it was very simple. There were three sections of the Old Testament. You always study them that way. The law, the writings, and the prophets. The writings would be those, those things like Job, uh, Song of Solomon, Proverbs, you know, that type of thing. He said, you study the law, you study, you study the writings, and you study prophecy. That was, that was very simple. That was very simple. That's what led me to write a series for our school of biblical theology called the Messianic Timelines. I, when I studied the Old Testament, I came out more confused than I went in. All I wanted to do was study about Jesus Christ. Show me Jesus Christ anywhere in the Bible, and you've got me. And nobody, you know, I never got it. And so when I studied, the, when I got ready to study the Old Testament with my kids, my, my young men, young men and women, I laid out the Messianic timeline. I showed them Christ in every part of the Old Testament. Show it to you in the law. I'll show it to you in the writings. I'll show it to you in the prophets. Because that's why they were written. The centerpiece of the Bible is Jesus Christ and none other as a centerpiece. And it's a powerful idea. It's a powerful idea. God intervened because God has selected two spiritual mature re people ready to do his will in the perfect timing and the plan of God. It was a little overwhelming, but it was their heart's desire in life to do God's will. And I love that about both of these people. I love that about them. I was a little bit disappointed, but I understand when Joseph didn't go to the Bible. Joseph, he was mature enough to know, well, what's the Bible say? Before I make this colossal decision in my life, I should ask, what does the Bible say? But he went the natural route. He went the creative route. Listen, you can go the creative route. There's nothing wrong with that. But then you've got to ask, is there any place in the Bible, because this is so out of the character of Mary, is there any place in the Bible that would say that a marriage-age Jewish young woman who is a virgin and of maritable age Think of if we had that today in America where you'd have to go. You'd have to get them at birth. A marital age from the tribe of Judah, from the house of David. 
I mean, those, those are three strong points, wouldn't you agree? That's three strong points. There we go. There we go. He should have asked himself, like all of us should, when you get into that place with, I don't know what I'm going to do, and you sit and you can't sleep at night, and you're all torn up, and yeah, 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 yeah. You ought to ask him, what's the Bible say? And then when you find the answer to it, you should stick to it, no matter what other decisions are made. Who backs the scriptures? Where's the power? Who, who backs the scriptures with power? God. God Almighty. God Almighty. Whether it's God, the Holy Spirit working in here, or the Son working in here, or God. But listen, it is all about that. You, you, should, you should write down Romans 4.21, and you should get it in your soul. What God has promised, he is able to perform. Of course he is, and he's the only one that can. You can't fulfill the word of God in the flesh. It can only be done in the power of the Spirit. And when you go to the power of the Spirit, the Spirit is going to claim the word to the Father, and the Father is going to do what he promised. What's the Bible say? I, I, in hunting season, do you think guys who love to hunt, I'm, I guess I'm talking about old days, not the modern days. But guys like that, you suppose they carried their gun with them with, with ammo? They did in my neighborhood. You never knew in hunting season. All the guys I went to high school with, all the guys that I went to high school had trucks and had gun racks with guns in them during the season. And it was not on... It was not unusual back then. You could hunt off the road. You can't anymore. Probably got too many cows. <clears throat> but, well, anyhow. It, it, I don't even know where I was going with that. Point two. Apparently nowhere. <laughs> Apparently nowhere. Point number two. I love this about God. Do you know God loves to brag about you? He loves to brag about you. Did you know that? I mean, more kids that are so depressed, Willie. They don't know why they're alive. They're not sure they should be. They don't know. Amen. Get them saved and tell, you, tell them, listen, I'll tell you somebody brags on you all the time, son. I'm going to tell you somebody started bragging the day you believed the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let me tell you who began bragging on you. God. Of all the kids, I've had my eye on that boy. I had my eye on that girl. And there is a celebration in heaven over one sinner that repents. There's a celebration in heaven. There's a birthday party. So what I love about Willie, Willie, Willie's grabbed that idea, and he does that. I love that. A birthday party. You have a birthday party. You celebrate their conversion and their baptism, their identity with Christ and with other people. I love that idea. I did it myself. God bragged about Mary, and he bragged about Joseph. God bragged about Mary and Joseph being ready for the enormous task set ahead of them in the plan of God because they were willing and ready to do the will of God. When we studied the book of, of Job, I got impressed with that idea. When Satan came before God and God bragged about Job, have you considered my man Job? And I went, oh God, uh, bring my name up at that council meeting. <laughs> Have you considered my... Well, I can't find anybody. You've got them all covered. up. <laughs> the devil moans and groans at the council meeting. Well, how about Job? Well, I've done, but you've got, you've got a wagon circled around him. You can't get a hedge. Move some of those wagons. Move that hedge from them. I get to them. I think he'd cry, Uncle. 
You know, it's old days when you would say, well, I'll let you up if you'll cry uncle. What, what, you know what I mean? Well, apparently not. God bragged about Job to Satan. The Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? For there's, watch this, there's no one like him on earth. Willie, grab that tagline and use it with your boys and girls. Because when they get saved in Jesus Christ, there's no one like them on earth. And they feel like, I don't know who I am. I don't know what I am. Nobody loves me. My parents have left me. They've done this, they've done that. Yeah, but let me tell you who hasn't, son. Who just, who just brought life into a dead corpse of your life. Who's brought life into you. And let me tell you, they'll brag. There's no one like him on earth. And there isn't. A blameless, upright, fearing God turning away from evil. That's what God loves about us. You're in a position now, child, to have God brag on you every day. Brag on you that you are blameless before men. That you are upright before God. That you're fearing God before angels. And you're turning away from evil before Satan. Did you get that? Your witness before men, before God, before angels, and before Satan. You should read 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, 13. And you should read the 7th chapter of 1 Corinthians, verse 1 and 2, talking to singles, and verse 3 through 5, talking to married. Now, I know you didn't write it down. Apparently, it's not important. You want it again? All right, I'll give it to you again. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overtaken you. You know why? Because God is faithful. Do you know one of the areas that Satan tempts most? Now listen to me. Your lack of control. Self-control. The lack of self-control in your life. Your lack of self-control. You know what the Bible says about this and that and this and that and this and that? And then I hear this from you. Well, I know I should give that up, but I can't. My, my, my. I want to pull my hair out and burn it before you. That's the craziest talk from a believer I've ever heard in my life. You know it's wrong. And you can't give it up? No temptation has overtaken you as such as common demand, but God is faithful who will lift you up out of that muck and mire, but you're not paying attention. What does the Bible say and how does it work? You say, well, I just don't have enough self control Why don't you quit that anger? You're angry all the time and why do you lash out at people? You don't have any self-control. I just can't help it. They, they just make me mad. And I just, yeah. All right, write this down because you, you, you got to get this. Our witness is, is all over the place. Would you agree? I just went through all the places your witness is. It's before men. It's before God. It's, it's before angels. It's before the devil, right? You never know when they're all showing up there. I mean, if your witness is to kind of catch people's attention and have them brag on you, that's not what I'm talking about. Where was I? I got excited there. What was my last point? I was getting ready to give you another scripture. Well, good luck. I don't know. I should have grabbed it while I had it. Let me show you. Let, 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 it, let me show you how he bragged on Mary. Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. Favored one? Listen. When God says that to you, that's a big deal. Would you agree with that? Hail, favored one? 
Greetings, favored one. Whoa. He said to Joseph, that's in Luke 126. He said to Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not willing to disgrace her, uh, planned to send her away privacy. Listen, he called him a righteous man. He bragged on his ex experiential righteousness. Joseph was a born-again person who had po positional righteousness of 2 Corinthians 5.21. He had positional righteousness. We all are righteous the moment we believe the gospel of Christ. We are righteous in the eyes of God. We will always be righteous because of the blood of Christ. Experiential righteousness is we're living the life of God out in our personal lives. We are experiential righteous. We are living the righteous life. We are making good choices on behalf of God. And then we have ultimate righteousness, which is the believer in eternity. If you have, if you have positional righteousness, you have ultimate righteousness. When you die, you're going to heaven. The key is to be that righteous person on earth where your witness goes before men, it goes before God, it goes before angels, and it goes before Satan in a powerful way. I encourage you this Christmas to be that witness because God brags on that witness. God brags on it. The invisible war, point three, the invisible war which they're going through that we all go through. The invisible war is called the angelic conflict. It's talked about Paul in the following three scriptures. If, and you should study these because you're in the warfare whether you like it or not. Ephesians 6, 10 through 17, we're told to put on the full armor of God. We're told that to do that to resist the devil in verse 13. Put on the full armor of God and resist the devil. In James, the fourth chapter, when James gets into this subject in verses, I don't know, about three or four down to seven, he says, resist the devil, and you know what he'll do? He'll flee from you. Now, resist the devil means you've got to come up and be armed and get, get after him. He'll either fall dead on the battlefield or run for his life. You understand what I mean? And he ain't going to fall on the battlefield until the day comes. So you and I are not going to knock him down on the battlefield. We have to resist him so he flees. When the Lord comes back, you get him. When the Lord comes back, he's a cooked goose. In case you're getting ready for Thanksgiving. What's interesting when you say, he says, put the full armor of God on? Do you, know the, do you know the five doctrines? He lists five doctrines. He puts them in codes, and you think, well, there, there's a belt, and then there's a breastplate, and there's a helmet. No, what are they? I mean, you don't walk around with these equipment on you. So what are they? Listen to me. You should study this stuff. Listen, it's truth, experiential righteousness, we call it plus R. Righteousness in a believer's life being worked out. We call it plus R. Well, this, let me tell you why. In, in Romans 3.10, there are none righteous, no, not one. We call that minus R. Well, it just saves us from writing a whole lot. After a while, if I forced you to write everything I talk about, you would love me to have codes. I, I grew up under a pastor. He made you write everything. Ephesians, the sixth chapter, 10, 10 through, to, to, through 17. Listen, he talks about truth. He talks about experiential righteousness. He talks about the gospel of peace. And he talks about faith. And then he talks about salvation, the, the security or the protection of salvation in your life. Just think about that. We're talking, he says, here, you, you want to have a defense against Satan? Here's the defense against Satan that he'll flee from you. Here's the defense. These are, these are defensive weapons. Truth. You have to have it to defend him off. You have to have experience of righteousness. He's afraid of that. He sees a hedge around you. 
the gospel of peace, he sure hates that. Because now you're reaching into, you're reaching into uh, his uh, stockade and, and pulling people out, POWs, pulling them out. That's Colossians 1.13, pulling them out. He don't like that at all. The gospel of peace, they don't like that. They don't like that. Faith, salvation. In 2 Corinthians 2.11 you're familiar with? No advantage. No advantage taken of you. No advantage over you. You know why? Because you're not ignorant of his, his strategy. I'm dealing with that on Tuesday called just three plays. Satan only has three plays to get you. He only has three. He he's just has three. You can beat him. You can beat him. You can beat him. 2 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, verses 3 through uh, 5, tells you once again how to defeat Satan. How to beat him. How to beat him. Hey, listen, the war is always in your head. Always in your head. It's a mind. I mean, that's the minefield. Depends on who's got it. Who's got it. And he talks about the angelic conflict is never about flesh. This is the 10th chapter, 2 Corinthians 10. Never about the flesh, but divinely powerful for victory. Take every thought captive to obedience. You should study that out of our Sunday lesson. Let me give you one more point and we'll take a break. I'll never get to five. I knew it. I knew it when I started this. I'd never get to five. That's home, that's home study. God referred to Joseph as being, being righteous. See, that's I mean, that's an absolute status quo verb of existence. You got to learn that. When you see I mean, that's an absolute status quo verb of existence. It's a present active participle. God referred to Joseph being the, hus the husband of Mary. And when he puts it in the present active participle, not of singular masculine, he's talking about a spiritually advancing believer who is a righteous man. <clears throat> it's a predicate adjective without a definite article, and it emphasizes the spiritual character of experiential righteousness and the impact it has on other people. So I wrote all that out there for you. This is a reference in the Bible to experiential righteousness of a believer that we call plus R. Just to help you. He says this to Joseph. This is kind of important. He said, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. In our passage, is one of those 15 things. <laughs> right? We saw 15 things. Yeah, one of them was out. Do not be afraid. You know what that is? Listen to me now. That's, it has E, it has M-E, the negative not. This, with a subjunctive, that's a, pro, a, a, a prohibitive. What's interesting about, that's a prohibitive. The subjunctive, gives you an eye up on it's volitional. It's a prohibitive that's involved in your volition or your free will. That's just, I'm just, this is common, common, like, this is 101 Greek. Listen, do not be afraid, but he used may with a subjunctive. This, but he put it in an aorist passive subjunctive. It's an aorist passive in, in a subjunctive. Subjunctive just says this is a volitional thing you've got to do. It's a prohibitive saying, don't make bad choices. He was, making, he, was about, he was about to make a bad choice, wasn't he? He already made up his mind he was going to get a divorce. When I get up in the morning, we're done. I'm going to sleep on it, right? We all, we all should be smart to do what he did. Let's, <laughs> let's sleep on it. Don't, make it. don't make that decision tonight. Let's sleep on it. Because you never know if you've got a teaching angel. Yeah, you, you're going to have one better than that. You're going to have the Holy Spirit. And so he, sa he said, I'm going to sleep on it. 
But what a wonderful choice that was. It was a good decision he made. I'm going to sleep on it. So he did. All right? A predicate adjective without a definite article emphasizes that the, 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 do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. A prohibitive. Now, here, here's the other po point that's of importance to us. It's in the aorist tense. Let me tell you what he means. It's volitional. It's tasked to volition. Subjunctive mood is tasked to volition. It's a prohibitive. Don't, do not do this. Every time the devil brings it up that you shouldn't have, you should not have married Mary. Because that was a pretty solid decision he based on on common, common sense, creative order of life, right? And he'd, and he'd come to a, a, a really solid conclusion about it. Agreed? You think he's going to be able to walk away from that easy? He's going to ha always have to come back because he's going to be, listen, the devil's going to bug him on it because he, he, he was about to eat from the tree. You understand <laughs> And then we're going to bug them and question it. And so God jumped up on him and he said, let me say, here's a defense mechanism. Huh? The belt of truth. Here's the belt of truth. When it comes up, you draw the sword, which is the word of God the spirit, of, the spirit of the sword is the word of God. That's what the belt of truth held. The belt of truth held the sword of the spirit, the word of God. And you know what he'll do? You know what the devil will do? He'll what? He'll flee from you. He'll run like the coward he is. He'll run from the truth. So, that'll do the first service. Sorry you guys got caught. I went over a little bit. I know you went, whoa, what is that guy talking about? Jeez. Well, that's after an hour. But thank you for coming and stay for the next session. So we're going to have, we're going to take an offering. Those who are visiting, don't worry about this offering. This is for the people. And um, then we'll have prayer. We'll take the offering. And we'll go downstairs and have a cup of coffee, a donut or something. Be sure to. And we'd like to get to meet you. Apparently, apparently you know people here. And very few people I got you, Willie. Very few people just stop off. We wish they would, but they don't. So let's have prayer, and the men will take the offering, and then we'll take a short break, and we'll come back to a second session. All right? We meet two hours on Sunday, so we don't have to come back in the evening. So we'd just rather, let's just go ahead and get it done at one time. Because we all live all over St. Clair County. Father, we're so thankful. For these that have come our way to study with us on the Christmas story of Mary and Joseph and the dilemma Joseph had and worked through it in a marvelous way. I, he wouldn't say it was marvelous. But in the afterthought it was because he came out with the same conclusion God wanted in his life. And that, that's about as good as it can get when you agree with God about things in your life that need to change. You're in a good place. I pray, Father, that we would be good stewards of the money that people give to us that we might reach to the ends of the earth with the gospel of Jesus Christ, especially Moody and especially St. Clair County. St. Clair County. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>